A special thanks today for everybody for stepping up. I understand we had a lot of holes, which is a good thing to have people fill. And of course, if you ever want an awkward time, just have uh, someone read Leviticus in front of the congregation. It's always fun. So I appreciate Dan reading those scriptures too. And everything, of course, is uh, for instruction. So uh, even Leviticus, as strange as some of that seems to us, um, there's something that we needed. So. If you haven't got a paper, there's a couple aids back there, a reading aid. If you would like one, uh, it's in the back. You can grab one. Um, it's just back in the back. So go ahead and grab one if you'd like that. Thinking about today, uh, the question we have when you need to keep in mind as we are going through this is, what is true faith in God? Not just having faith in God. I'm talking about true faith in God. That's going to be your own definition. This is just for your uh, instruction. And name one area in your own life where you have exhibited this kind of faith. And also looking on the reverse end of that, name one area of your life where you have not, where you're not exhibiting that kind of faith. It's very good to be introspective and look at your own life and say, these are things that I'm doing good and these are things that I'm doing bad. (laughs) Benjamin Franklin used to sit there and write in a journal every day trying to get a perfect day. And every day he would mark the things that he had done wrong that day and trying to make himself perfect. For what I know, he never had a perfect day, but it was interesting that he tried it, something that none of us probably have thought about. As we're answering that question, we're looking at the study here. It says, one of my favorite song lyrics is from one of my favorite bands. I was very blessed to go see them not too long ago, the Ava Brothers. And then one, and one of their songs is called Once and Future Carpenter. They sing, if I live the life I'm given, I won't be scared to die. I talk about this because too often we see Christians and non-Christians alike who are absolutely mortified by the fact that they will eventually die. We even see here in Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, and it says, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. We see time and time again people dying in the Bible. We see it all around us, yet we tend to ignore this fact. From what I've seen in this world, the reason that they are so mortified by the thought of something that is as natural as birth. Let me say it again. It's as natural as birth. When someone is born, you see their picture all over Facebook, and you see it trumpeted on billboards. There's a billboard in Steubenville. Look, they just gave birth to somebody. And there's like a baby on there. So people are very excited about it. But death, we don't want to talk about anymore. And it's more natural than practicing every other given occurrence in life. You know, you think about marriage. You think about having children, high school graduation. Those things aren't given in our lives, but we take them as given. Death is a given. It is something that will happen to all of us. Is that people have lived or are living lives that they are uh, devoid of true faith and belief in the power of God. I think that's why people try to ignore death. Because they don't really see death as anything but an ending. We're scared of an ending. We don't like the ending of something that we deem good. Well, we'll look at that today and you'll see that Maybe death is not so much an ending as it is a beginning. Let's look at Mark 9, 22 through 24. Some of your Bibles probably have this labeled as all things possible. It's kind of an interesting passage. We don't read too much. I had not read it for a long time. When I uh, was looking at this lesson, I thought this was kind of perfect to go along with what we had here. As the disciples are talking and the scribes are arguing with them is what is happening, just to kind of give you some, some exposition here. Verse 21, so we're going to be picking up. There is a, a, a Jesus comes up to them, a man, there's like a ravenous crowd there. A man has a young boy who is struck in with the spirit. He is mute because of this spirit. And he, get, and he says, when the spirit hits him, he goes into convulsions and he kind of just hits the floor. A very strange occurrence and he's asking Jesus right here in verse 21 and he asked uh, or Jesus he asked him to heal him and, and Jesus asked his father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood it has often often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him but if you can do anything take pity on us and help us this kid had had so bad that he would throw get thrown into a fire I was just in Japan recently, and there's a guy, he had bandages all of his, he was one of our tour guides, and all of his legs. I said, what happened to you? He said, I was uh, camping. He said, I tripped and fell into the fire. He had like third-degree burns all over 
his, his body, which is, you know, horrific. I mean, I guarantee you would say it's not fun. Water to destroy him. So it's trying to kill him. Imagine something living inside you trying to kill you. Not a pleasant situation. But he says, if you can do anything, remember, who is he talking to here? To Jesus. If you can do anything, he's probably trying to be humble about it. You know, if you could do anything, doctor, please help me. Kind of one of those things. Take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, what's he say there? Not if you can. He says, if you can? I love that. Jesus kind of has these moments where you see that Jesus was here since the beginning of time. Jesus has these moments where you see that he is God on earth. He, it's, it's almost hilarious for his creation to ask, can you do something to help me? If, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Remember that. All things are possible to him who believes. This is where true faith comes in. Because too often we look at things and we go, hmm. I don't know if this is important or not. I, I, I don't know if God is with me. Immediately the boy's father cried and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. It's kind of a weird thing to say, right? I do believe in you, Jesus. Help my unbelief. They say, oh, he doesn't really believe. Why well, are we all sad with that? People here today, most likely you have some belief in God. Or you wouldn't be here today, Right? But there's still times when we just get immune to the world or something. I don't know what it is. We get, like, just dumb, and we don't do the right things. And we need help to fix our unbelief. Or we look at a situation that looks so daunting, we say, I need help in this situation. Help me believe in you, God. And that's exactly what's <laughs> happening here. Like the Father's experience with Jesus in Mark 9, there have been several parts of my own life where I have lived a life that was devoid of true faith and belief in the power of God. It just crops up sometimes. You don't even mean to do it sometimes. During these times, I too have looked at death as an ending, one that could, I could avoid by completely ignoring it. And too often I've been afraid to leave this life or lose my loved ones to death. However, also like the Father in Mark 9, through the grace of God, there have been several opportunities that I have been blessed with which have woken my soul to the true power of God and to the fact that death is not as frightening as the world makes it seem. You see there in Philippians 1, 21, it says, For me, Paul says, for me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a famous verse from Paul. He's saying, I would rather die because I know what it's like. I have faith that there is something afterwards. There is going to be a more perfect world after this. This death is not the ending. Paul did not see it as an ending. He saw it as a beginning to eternity. Make no mistake about it. This life is a short journey. Short journey. I always remember my dad doing an illustration where he put a line on the board and then he put a little dot. He says, this is your life. And this is eternity. It's a very simple but effective illustration. We think that this is it. We grasp onto this. We hold on to this life as if it is some wonderful, glorious treasure. Why is that? Because it's the only thing we've ever known? I'm not sure. Or is it our lack of faith? One of the opportunities that have been so prevalent in my life is the lessons I've learned while adventuring. I like to travel. I've been to, I think, 12 different countries uh, around the world. I uh, spent some time in, in a lot of different countries and uh, getting to know different people. I've been in places. I'm just in Japan. Uh, we went to uh, Tokyo Disney World, of all things, and I was like the only uh, white person there. Uh, and so, you know, it's one of those things where you don't think about it because over here, like, we're all just mixed. So it's awesome. Like, you know, we have all these different races and, and people come together, which is a wonderful thing. And over there, you're just kind of like, you don't get that feeling of every Japanese person looking at you. Like, and you're like, why are they looking? Oh, I'm white. <laughs> you don't think about it. So those things like that put, put you in a, in a good spot sometimes, put yourself in different people's shoes. But I've been able to adventure a lot. Be it close as Beth, Bethany, West Virginia, I have adventured there. Saw some interesting things in Bethany, of course, or as far as Tibet. Uh, I have loved putting myself in places with strange faces and unique customs. 
I have loved walking through ruins thousands of years older than me. I have loved being dwarfed by mountain ranges, awed by the vastness of everything, and humbled by how very, very small, but oh so very important. Don't ever forget that, folks. We all are in the story we call life. Why do I love it so much? Because the adventures the Lord has taken me on are the ones that have not only helped me gain a deeper appreciation for my Lord, but has given me enough faith to say, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? I love that. Very rarely you see Christians get boastful almost. And Paul just looks death in the eye and says, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Everybody else is so afraid of death. The Christian person is not afraid of death. It's not a scary thing if you think about it as a Christian. It is an awesome thing. It is a wonderful thing. Now, I'm not telling you to go home and kill yourself. Please don't think that because that's completely contrary to what I'm saying. Paul had that kind of similar thought, I think, where he says, for me to live is Christ. He's saying, I'm living for Christ until he decides that it is the end of my time and he takes my life away. God has a plan for everything, even your death. Seeing as to how we're all on a journey together, the journey of life, and for some, the journey of Christianity, today we're going to explore several lessons that I have learned myself while traveling in hopes that we, uh, helps, helps you discover or rediscover your true faith and belief in God and his plan for you in this life and after. The first point there is all the world is a testament to God's genius. Let's look at, real quick at Job 12, 7 through 10. Look at Job 12, 7 through 10. I love this verse. It says, But now ask the beasts, and let them teach you, and the birds of the heavens, and let them tell you, or speak to the earth, and let it teach you, and let the fish of the sea declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is in the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? This is a moment we are getting taken away from us more and more and more. Jesus would go out into the woods to pray to God. He would go in the middle of God's creation. Jesus would not take out his iPhone and look at his iPhone the entire day. He wouldn't do that. We are taking ourselves and we're putting ourselves in a very small box. I remember when I was going to be a teacher in Maryland, the very first thing I ever went to, I went to an interview down there in Maryland, Garrett County, Maryland, if you've never been there, Please do go. It's only two hours away, and it's an easy day trip, and it's a beautiful place. And I went down there, and I was like, wow, this I've passed a million times going to Washington, D.C., but I never had stopped. I never had a desire to see, because from the road, from the highway, all you see is just regular old boring stuff. And I go off the road, and I'm like, whoa, this place is gorgeous. So the very first thing I did, I was trying to make small talk with a secretary. Mrs. Barry was her name. She's a very kind woman, always very busy, typing, 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 typing. And I go, she goes, oh, sit down, please, and all this stuff. And I go, man, you guys live in just a gorgeous area here. And she just stopped for a second and goes, really, I wouldn't know. I've never left. Here's a lady in her early 50s who had never left the county. Therefore, she did not see the beauty of God's creation all around her. It was almost comical and still is comical to me to this day to think about. But are Christians like that? We never think outside the box. I think it's annoying, uh, really, really annoying, actually, when we go on vacation in this world and we try not to find a church. We don't look for a church. Now, as a young man, I would be like, when we go on vacation, I would be like, yeah, we didn't find church. We don't have to go to church this morning. That's the way you are when you're young and dumb. But as you get older, you realize, I have met so many wonderful friends, especially with Facebook and things like that, that you could stay in contact with, and they build you up as you go. So why would you not put yourself out there, see the world differently? A lot of the things that we do here that are different than other congregations are because people have traveled to other congregations and said, hey, they're doing this down there. That's probably a better idea than what we're doing here. And we look at it and see if it goes with the Bible, and if it does, we change things. But all the world is a testament to God's genius. I remember I got the privilege to go skiing down the Alps. Now, I will tell you, I've only skied two times in my life when that just happened. And so I get to go to Innsbruck, Austria. 
take a train to Austria. And I've been to the Himalayas, I've been to the Rocky Mountains, I've seen those kind of mountains, and I've seen mountains. So I'm like, it's just going to be mountains, right? And I remember going into the train, it was in January, and riding on the train, I look out, and I'm like half asleep, I look to the side of me, and very rarely does nature just awe you so much. Like, it just awed me. I'm like, wow, those are huge mountains, just gigantic mountains. And so I finally get up to go skiing on this place. This is an Olympic, like three-time Olympic course. And again, I'd only been skiing twice before, and it hadn't been like a year before that. And so I go up, and, and I'm kind of trying not to pay attention to literally five or six people getting taken out by ambulance as they're going. I'm like, oh, that won't happen to me, you know. So I go, okay, I'm just going to go, I'm going to hit it hard. First one, I'm just going to go up this tram. It's not a ski lift. It was literally like a trolley that takes you up a mountain. That's how big it is. And I'll go to the top and I'll ski down. That won't be that hard, right? I'm not a person who's afraid of a lot. That's what I'm saying. So I get to the top of this mountain, I get out on my little skis, I go out just a little bit far. First thing I see is a huge cross. And then I look around, and here's the men's course, Olympic ski course, which just goes literally straight down for like miles. Like I'm like, I'm not doing that. Here's the women's, women's, mind you, Olympic ski course, which goes down a dip, and it's literally probably about this wide on each side. And then on each side is a huge drop off. And I'm like, all of a sudden, my heart starts to flutter a little bit. And I go, I'm going to die up here. That's what this cross is for. And literally, it took me a very long time. I'm talking 30 minutes to an hour to get up any courage. I literally was just, just how do I ski? How I forgot. I forgot. That's God. You look around and see all these people up there. And you think, wow, God's creation has just made me forget even how to ski. I couldn't even remember, like, remember my name hardly. It was just so, I, I thought I was going to die. Well, I did get down the mountain. It took me about three hours, I think, and uh, I was falling constantly. And these little women were laughing at me and saying, oh, we'll help you ski. And they helped me down the mountain. But when I got down, I didn't go up again. That was it. I had one, one thing for the day, and then I was done. But just being up there and just like seeing pictures and just taking time, You've seen how beautiful God's creation was. Even to the top of the highest mountain, to the lowest sea, God has everything in order, and he is a genius about how he's created it. Let's look at Jeremiah 8, 7 through 8. For those who don't believe in the Bible, it says even there on Jeremiah 8, 7 through 8, Even the stork in the sky knows her seasons, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of the migration. And, but my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? You think about those kind of things like that. God has everything in perfect order. I remember my friend Sean, who I love very dearly. He's, he's not... Uh, uh, very much in the church. I call him basically a religious mutt. He's been to several different churches, but he just never has been satisfied someplace. And it's not that he doesn't believe in God, it's just he doesn't really practice anything. And so we were out there one day, and he said, what if I don't believe in the Bible? And I just remember looking at the stars, and I said, look around you and see how everything works in perfect order, how everything knows its season, how the trees are going to start shedding their leaves here for winter and fall. And I said, it just so perfect. How can you not realize that? That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes getting your face out of this. Yes, older folks, you are as addicted, if not more addicted than some of us young people. Put that away. Even during church, I don't even have my phone on vibrate. I put it on airplane mode so it doesn't even go off because if it does, I'll be tempted to look at it and see. And that distraction, what happens with that distraction? It takes you away from God. And we cannot be like that. If God has equipped the beast of the field for every good work, what makes you think he hasn't equipped you? Too often we see people who don't have faith in God. You can tell that because they say, oh, I can't invite people to church. I can't do this. I can't do that. Can't should not be in a Christian's vocabulary. You can do all things through Christ. And you're sitting there going, oh, Nathan, you don't understand. You've had this handed to you. You've had this. I've never had something handed to me. I'll tell you that right now. And you haven't either. We've worked for things. That's life. You work for things. Don't sit there and tell somebody else and make an excuse and say, you don't understand my life. No, you don't understand the power of God. And your faith is in the wrong place. Let's look at Matthew 6, 25-26. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. 
as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they are? Do you see a bird ever go to a counselor to try to get some help? Never seen that. It's comical. Why would that be like that? Well, the bird should be stressed out. The bird does not have an income. They don't have a job. They can't go buy food. They're relying on God to provide for them. And I've never seen a bird worried about food. God provides for them. Why would he not provide for you? Let's look at Hebrews 13 and 20 and 21. We're looking at 21 most specifically. Equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. He equips us for every single good work. Chuck didn't think he could teach class this morning. He got up there and did a fine job. It's, it's tough to get there on, on a whim, but he did it. Because you put yourself forward. You sit there and go, God is behind me. I will make mistakes. I will falter, as we talked about Moses today. Did Moses make mistakes? Yes, he made many mistakes throughout his entire life. Was Moses a good man? Yes. Did God love Moses? Of course. And so many wonderful things happened to Moses because he had his faith in God. Let's look at our next point here on the back. There's a song called You'll Never Walk Alone. It's from a musical, I think, called Carousel by Rodgers and Hammerstein. That's not why I really like it. I like it because I like Liverpool Football Club, and that's their, their anthem. You know, it's a, imagine 30, 40,000 people singing uh, a musical song. Kind of weird, but they do it, and that's kind of their, their trumpet. But the whole song is talking about you'll never walk alone. If you're walking through the storm, you're walking through the rain, don't worry, you'll never walk alone. When we think about that, we compare that to Christ. And Christ and God is with us right now. He is with you when you go home. He is with you when you are by yourself. But why is it so difficult for us to realize that we are not alone? For me, that humbling experience came that I really am not alone when I was a sophomore in college. I had the opportunity to go to bed with some of my fraternity brothers. I joined a fraternity, which I'm not going to say is the best idea, because I thought I could help people out. And I thought they just brought me down more than anything else. Again, bad company corrupts good morals. And, and though I might not have been the worst worldly person in the world, I was not a very good Christian at that time. And so they invite me to go, and I said, that's kind of an interesting thing. I'd never been on a plane, took the plane. It took, took 24 hours to get there. Uh, I got sick in the plane, I remember. It was a long, long trip. And when we got there, some things happened, which I won't get into, but the guy that we were staying with and helping there uh, was a American. He's a, a, they police the Americans that go into Tibet. Not very many people can go there. It's, it's very hard to get into. And so uh, we were helping him out, helping him build some things for school and whatnot. And so some things happened the night before, and I was not very happy with him and some of the things he was doing. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to get into that. But my chaperone, our chaperone is an older man, and, and all my fraternity brothers got mad at me. And, and said, uh, I'm sick of his holier-than-thou attitude. I remember the windows are wide open. They're just screaming it. Uh, they were drunk as can be. I don't know if they even remember it probably to this day. But just always holier-than-thou attitude. And, stuff. and so they take off the next morning. The guy leaves me with no money, which he, we gave him money uh, to take care of us or whatever, no food, and no water. We can't drink the water over there because you'll get sick very quick. So I had half a bottle of water, and I uh, had a granola bar, and just a little piece of candy for the whole day. They, they got mad at me and just left me. This is a full-grown man uh, and uh, three, supposedly, men uh, that left. And so they left, and uh, four, I guess. And uh, so I sat there, and, and I was depressed. I had a tough time. I had a sophomore year in college. It's not to get into that either. Of course, it's all over a girl at that time. And so I was just, just down, and like I, I couldn't put myself out there very good. You know, it was one of those things where like every time you put yourself out there, you kind of felt like you know, people are getting mad at you for being who you are kind of thing. So you kind of just tailored back your personality. You ever had that happen? I'm sure we all have. And so I sat there, and the whole time I wanted to go to the Himalaya Mountains. They were off in the distance in a little town we were in called Jean Bien. And I said, I wanted to go to the Himalaya Mountains. Oh, yeah, we'll get there, Nathan. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll go. They had no intentions of going at all. That was like the one thing I wanted to do. They had no intentions of going. So I sat there by myself, very, very depressed, very sad for myself, feeling pity for myself. 
And I, I opened the windows and I look out and I said, you know what? I'm going to go do this myself. Myself, I thought myself, you know. And so I, I did. I put my book bag on, took my half a bottle of water, took my granola bar, and I started walking. And now imagine again, here's a situation where I'm the white guy walking through Tibet. They don't see white people, literally. They, they thought I was, uh, they thought I loved Backstreet Boys, which I didn't, and Michael Jackson. I don't know why. Like, that was before Michael Jackson was cool again. And I was like, no, I don't love either one. No, thank you. Uh, but so they had stereotypes with every, you know. So I'm walking through. These guys had the, the hats on. You know, the farmers had the hats on. There were soy fields, yak fields. I'm walking through yak fields and things. It's so strange uh, by myself. And I'm just waving. I'm like, I'm going to have a good attitude today. Just like I was in Wellsburg, West Virginia. Hey, how are you? They give me the weirdest looks. Like, what in the world? I don't even know if that's an insult over there. I really don't. And if it was, I'm sorry to them. But so I'm walking through, and I, and I remember getting to this dirt fence. This is how dangerous it was. There's a, they, they piled the dirt up. That's how they make a fence, right? And there's these dirt huts. And I'm thinking, oh, National Geographic. This is really cool. I'm going to walk in here, and there's going to be some like little half-naked kids come out. I'll be like, here's some candy. And, stupid thinking, you know. But you think, oh, National Geographic. So I, got that. so I go into the fence in the hut. I remember the hut. And there's a dark, dark hole where they go in or whatever. And I remember seeing these beady eyes look back at me. And I'm like, that's not a little kid. What is that? And the next thing I knew, everything went in slow motion. As If you've never looked up, Wayne, you probably know what this is, a Tibetan Mastiff dog. They're pretty big, right? Do you agree with me on that? Pretty giant dogs. Well, this evidently was the little village's guard dog, and I had stepped across the line. So this dog was chomping at me. One, I mean, it's a horse. I'm serious. Look it up on Google, and you'll be amazed. Chomping at me, and I'm like slow motion running. I remember jumping on top of the fence, like doing one of these kind of things, balancing, and the dog is just clawing at the fence. And I'm like, I'm okay. I'm just jumping on the other side of the fence. I, I kid you not, I go to jump across the fence, and there's a dead boar on the other side of the fence. I said, I'm just going to walk the fence. That's what I'm going to do. Thank goodness I had a little bit of balance because I just walked the fence as the Tibetan Mastiff dog just paced after me. And I'm like, Phew. so anyway, I get to the bottom of the mountains. I want to get to the Himalaya mountains. I'm very depressed about things. Just trying to look on the bright side. It's getting a little bit darker out, but I don't see that. So I decide I'm going to start climbing this mountain. Well, I get about one third of the way up the mountain, and I'm sitting there on a rock, completely exhausted. My water's been gone. My food has been gone. I, if the sun beats down on you, you get tired. And I'm just sitting there going, I cannot go on. You're depressed, and don't we all think that? I can't go on. I'm doing this by myself, we think, don't we? This is all me. I can't go further. I'm doing all this. And as I'm sitting there, I still remember I heard it. Oh. And I, I found out later there are bears in Tibet. Which <coughs> if I would have known that, I probably wouldn't have stayed. But I heard it. Oh. Oh, what is that? And from the horizon, I remember sitting like right here, and over here was a hill, and I still remember this haystack just start coming up the hill. Oh, 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 I'm getting bigger and bigger. And wouldn't you know, at the low and behold, on the bottom of that haystack, wearing that thing, I'm talking ginormous haystack, was probably an 85-year-old woman, just a betting woman. Just wearing that thing like a backpack. And just, she just looks at me like, who in the world are you? And I remember I was just like, what is happening now? She couldn't speak a word of English, and I couldn't speak a word really of Chinese too much. And she just looks at me right in the eyes and goes, oh, oh. <laughs> And in my optimistic brain, I go, you're right, old woman. I shouldn't stop. And so I continued up that mountain. I said, thank you so much. I didn't help her with that. I don't know what happened. But I, I, I hope she made it. I mean, if she made it that far, she's doing good. I just couldn't do it. So I started walking up the mountain again. And what you know about halfway up the mountain, one more trial happens. I get there, done, beat, tired, wore out, mentally beat up, thinking about all the things my friends, my friends were saying, mean, hateful things about just stupidity, really. And I'm like, I can't go on. I'm literally crawling at this point, just on my hands and knees. I'm just crawling. I'm just so exhausted. And right when I think that I cannot make it, I can't go any further, there's nothing I can physically do anymore. When you know, just like out of the movie, I felt a raindrop hit my head. 
I kid you not, took my Brook football windbreaker that I had on, and I passed through a rain cloud. This is a fact. I drenched that, like I was going to survive her, drenched that windbreaker and drank out of that coat. I was so thirsty, and God provided water for me. He sit there and go, that's just a coincidence. No, that's God. Nothing's coincidence. When I got to the top of that mountain, I looked out, and I still had not thought about it. And I look out, and I'm like, oh, this is so beautiful. I'm like the only one who's ever seen this, I think. Me, me, me. I want to tell everybody. I want to talk to everybody about this. And then I realized, I'm alone up here. And I got sad for a second. And it finally hit me. It finally took all of this traveling half the world around, having a ridiculous adventure to realize that I never had done any of that alone. I had never been alone. In my 21 years of living, I had never been alone, and I was not at that moment. I was not the only one who had ever seen this sight. God was with me every step of the way. And when you sit there and you think, oh, I just cannot do this alone, Think of God and how he's with you every step of the way. I know that's a long story, but it's a big one. Be strong and be courageous. What does courageous mean? Not deterred by danger or pain. You are not deterred by that. I will continue on. Let's look at Joshua 1.9. We'll just look at one of these for time. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. And there's an exclamation point there for a reason. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whether you're on the top of the mountain in Tibet or we are right here, God is with you. Never forget that and never take that for granted. Here's the other caveat to that. The devil is with you always too. And that's the sad thing. And he will tempt you as he did so many times in my life and will continue to do so. Look at 2 Corinthians 2 and 11. So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant to his schemes. Are you ignorant to Satan's schemes? Have you been tempted and failed time and time again? When are you going to stand up and when are you going to be courageous and bold? And when are you going to say, no more, Satan, no more. I don't want to do this anymore because I know God is with me and everything is possible through God. Everything. Well, you don't understand. I'm addicted to drinking alcohol. That's a very tough addiction to break. Yeah, I understand that. That's a tough addiction. But we all have hurdles we have to overcome. Well, you don't understand. I, I, I have this uh, in my past. I've cheated on my husband. I've cheated on my wife. And they don't know about it. I, I can never overcome that. You can overcome everything through God. These are just a fleshly body. Our soul is what is important. But God is with you always. Look at Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will go with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. All things work for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Look at Romans 8.28. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, not death. Death, they took my father, they took my grandmother, they took, I had someone tell me, you don't understand anything because you've never lost your parents. That was a Christian told me that. That is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I will lose my parents one day or they'll lose me. It's going to happen one way or the other. That's the way life's going to be. And when it does, it's going to be hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. It is very difficult. But when your parents, when your family members, when your friends are living a godly life, I don't know why we are so mournful and act like we will never see them again. Folks, come on. Have faith in God. We think that this is the end-all, be-all, and it is not. You will spend eternity with them if you do what God wishes for you to do. It's that simple. You will see them again. That should be motivation for us. That should be something, a catalyst for us to help us continue. Yet too often it becomes less of a catalyst and more of a stumbling block. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares who? The Lord. 
plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. God always has plans for you. You've seen it time and time again. You think about if someone passes away, good things actually happen from that. Think about a tree in the forest. You can learn from that. I, I love running. Shannon and I love to run this one place out of Bethany. We run it all the time. And I remember seeing this tree fall. I'm like, oh, that poor tree. I just really like that tree. It's just an old tree. It's kind of cool. It just fell. A storm happened. Something happened. And it, it died. Well, you know what's happening from that tree? Now things are growing from that tree. That tree is feeding life. It's the same thing with our earthly death. We will feed earthly life and hopefully spiritual life through that. Number three, people actually do give up everything. I was coming back from Japan, and I was on a plane coming from Chicago to Pittsburgh, and there was this little Indian girl sitting beside me. And I didn't really pay too much attention. I was very tired, and we started getting in some, some bumps, some bumps on the road there. And I remember she, the reason I know this is because she grabbed my leg. <laughs> What in the world? I'm like, you're, they're kind of laughing. I said, you all right? She goes, is it always like this going to Pittsburgh? And I'm like, uh, it's just a little bit of turbulation. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll all go turbulence. It'll, it'll go away. Okay. She was very worried. I said, is this the first time you've ever been to Pittsburgh? She goes, yes, this is the first time I've ever been to America. Of course, now I'm interested in her story. Well, where are you from? Well, today I left from India. I'd always wanted to go to America to study engineering. She was going to Pitt University. I wanted to study engineering. She had to choose between Pitt and WVU. I was like, come on. But she chose Pitt. Anyway, but she came. She grew up in the same place in India. She had went to school in India. She went to college in the same place in India. And after all this, she left her family and literally came halfway around the world to study where she knew no one. She gave up every single thing she had. I said, were your parents sad? Oh, yes, they cried very, very much. Have you ever left for something like that? Think about it. <coughs> That's the way we should treat God. You give up every single thing for God because you, she said, I had a dream since I was a little girl. Do you have a dream of making it to heaven? Do you have any kind of faith that you'll make it to heaven? Will you give up everything? Oh, you're asking too much, Nathan. That's, God doesn't want us to give up everything. Look at Luke 14, 33. So then none of you can be my disciples who do not give up all his possessions. You don't believe that? Look at the story in Matthew 19, 16 through 22 of the rich young ruler who came there and he was saying that I want to follow you, God. And what does God say? Give up all your possessions. And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And what does he do? But when the young man heard the statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. No offense to anybody in here, but none of us really own a lot of property. None of us are high rollers in the grand scheme of things. We're all middle class. You know, that's just the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But even being like middle class American, we don't want to give up everything. We don't want to give up anything, let alone everything. We need to reposition ourselves on that and think a little bit more. Some people will willfully never understand this. Look at Jeremiah 6 or 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. My brothers and my sisters and people who are not Christians here, you need to think about these things. Have your ears been closed up? I've seen people who are Christians. I myself have acted in this way at some point where I think that I'm doing something right and you tell me it's wrong and I say there's no way this is wrong. My ears, my mind is closed up to the truth and it shouldn't be that way. We should seek God first as it says in Matthew 6 33 but seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you and surround yourself with ones who do for bad company corrupts good morals it says in 1 Corinthians 15 33 and Matthew 18 20 for when there are two or three gathered in my name I am in their midst 
I am in their midst. And the last point we have here tonight, today, one of the best things I've ever learned about traveling and taking adventures is that coming home is better than the adventure itself. I'm sure all of us have had this experience when you go on vacation and you say, oh, you know, this is the most relaxing vacation ever. But there's always that slight, if not magnified, thing saying, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to sleep in my own bed. I'm ready to see my friends. Home is a place where one lives permanently. The afterlife is where our soul will live permanently. Look at Hebrews 9, 27 to 28, looking most at 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. That's what will happen. Home is heaven, not earth, not 161 Orchard Lane in Wellsburg, West Virginia. It's not wherever your home is at. It is not earth. And here's a little thing, too, for you. Home is not hell. Home is not just the afterlife. Hell is permanent, yes. And you will live there. But home is the place you want to get to. Home is referred to as heaven several times in the Bible. Hell is never referred to as a home. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 8. 2 Corinthians 5 and 8. It says, We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And then you see in the story of the rich man and the poor man and Lazarus. And you see in Luke 16, 23 and 24, he's in hell, a hell-like state. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away in Lazarus' bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And sent Lazarus that he may tip his finger on my tongue. You think about that. And you think about how much more torment it is to see hope but be so far away. Think about these soldiers that fight overseas and, and how when they see a picture of home or when you're just gone for a couple weeks from home and you see a picture from home, oh, I miss that. I miss that. When I went to Japan, I missed Lydia's birthday. That was sad for me. I really wanted to go. It hurt my feelings that I couldn't be there. But you can't always be there, right? You do miss home. There's a... Not many people will probably quote P. Diddy from the pulpit. <laughs> but this song, uh, lyric, is good. It says, I'm coming home, I'm coming home. Tell the world I'm coming home. Let the rain wash away the pain of yesterday. I know my kingdom awaits. And they've, got, and they've forgiven my mistakes. I'm coming home, I'm coming home. Tell the world I'm coming home. Are you telling the world that you're a Christian? Are you excited about being a Christian? Are you telling the world that you want to go home as in heaven, or do you sit there and never talk about it because you're afraid people look at you? Oh, if I talk about that there's like a life after death, people think I'm so weird. Who cares what people think? Who cares what people think? The truth. We know the truth. Proclaim the joy of God, as it says in Psalms 105.1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. The pain of the journey is totally worth it all. If you get made fun of, no one cares. It's totally worth it all. Romans 8, 18. For consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is revealed to us. The things that you're going to get into heaven are so much more wonderful than some idiot making a smarmy remark to you on this earth. Who cares? Who cares? Well, you don't understand. They make fun of me. It just hurts my feelings. You don't think Jesus got made fun of? Jesus was crucified for you. One of the last things that really helped me get over death and one of the things that really go along with things is a, a quote by, from Peter Pan. I love this quote. I love the Peter Pan pose and all that stuff. He's an arrogant little boy, right? That's one thing we know about him. He's going to face Captain Hook. And I remember, and of course, Captain Hook, uh, he's going to be outnumbered. All the pirates... And Captain Oak versus Peter Pan. And Peter Pan is certainly going to die. Wendy and all the lost boys say, don't go, Peter. Don't go. Don't leave us. And Peter looks back in his arrogance, almost very much like Paul when he's boasting about uh, not being afraid of death. And he looks back and he says, to die? What a great adventure that would be. Hmm. I'm not a tattoo person, but if I ever got one, I might get that. I'm 
I'm never going to get one, so it's not a big deal. To die, what a great adventure that would be. Because that's something that sticks in my mind and is tattooed on my brain. And every time I think about death being this scary thing, I think about all the great journeys I've taken, all the great people I've met throughout life, all the great things I have seen. And then I realize that this earth is just a temporary place. And I realize how much greater heaven's going to be. Because that is home. That is the place I want to be. That is the place I yearn to be. Are you going to return home with me? Are we going to go together? One thing is for certain. One day, all of us in here will not be here. There will be new people in our seats, hopefully. A whole new generation. And we will be this people that people have talked about. I remember so-and-so. And I remember so-and-so. Are you leaving a good example for them? Are you leaving a path that is easier for them to follow to heaven? Or are you doing the theoretical picking up of the bread and tossing it somewhere else? Live a life for God, folks. And if you haven't started living a life for God, there's some simple, simple steps. You have to hear what you heard today. It says in Romans 10, 17. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins. I don't want to live like this. I want to change my ways. Confess, I have been a sinner, and I want to be no more. Be baptized, immersed, and rose anew, and live faithfully unto death. If you have not done any of those things, you need to do so today. And it says in the after study, with all this, prepare, all this in mind, are you prepared to go to heaven today? And I say that to every single person in here, including myself. And if you're not prepared to go to heaven, what is tripping you up, and why are you letting it trip you up? And there's a little quote there that says, A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And there's a song that says, Only a step. That's all it takes. A first step. You don't need to come forward. You can just raise your hand and say, I want to be baptized. No one cares. Today is the day to do it. Today is the day to change your life. Today is the day to begin your journey home. Please stand as we sing the song.